Giuseppe Verdi is my favorite composer of opera. Period. There. I said it. There's just no getting around the fact that he was thoroughly brilliant and wrote some really stunning works for the stage that still, after some 150 years, speak to us today. They have relevance because they deal with human issues, and we, after all, are human. So we can't help but be touched by these works. Operas like Otello, Aida, Rigoletto, La Traviata. It's all pretty amazing. A work that we don't get to see too often, though, is the third opera in our 2014 lineup, and that's Un Ballo in Mascara, a masked ball. In terms of the story of its creation, it is one of Verdi's most unusual pieces. There were many twists and turns that the opera's libretto went through before it was considered safe by state or church censors to, to be performed in public. But that's a story I cover in my TV show, Opera Talk with UCSD, and that episode will premiere in a couple months. I'd like to talk a little bit today about the very true story that the opera was based on. It's a story about royalty, political intrigue, and forbidden love. Gustav III was the king of Sweden from 1771 till 1792. He was a really interesting guy who loved culture and the arts, especially opera, and in fact anything to do with theater. He wrote his own plays. He insisted on acting in them as well, not just being the main character, but also sometimes being the stage director as well. And you can imagine what it must have been like to be directed by the king, especially if his directions were at all questionable or out of taste. Thing is, he wasn't really good at the money thing. Oh, he knew how to spend it all right, but he wasn't particularly good at making it. Among the many national adventures he committed to was a disastrous war with Russia, which Sweden won, but it practically broke the country. It was the economic disaster that Sweden became that forced the hand of courtiers and military officers who despised Gustav and decided to forge history for themselves. They instituted a plot to assassinate the king. One Jakob Johann Ankerstrom was selected to do the deed. It was decided that the murder would occur at the Royal Opera House during a masked ball on the evening of March 16, 1792. Ankerstrom brought a pair of pistols with him to the ball, hiding them in the folds of his costume. The king was easily spotted because of a silver insignia that he wore on his cape. He was greeted by the conspirators and distracted for a few moments at which time the gunman took his chance and shot the king in the back on his left side. The king didn't die of the wound, at least not right away. He died of an infection which set in later, finally ending his life 13 excruciating days later. Ankerstrom, the assassin, was captured the day after the ball, and he was eventually executed in April of that same year, 1792. Many of the other conspirators, though, were pardoned by the king in the last few days of his life. So that's the basic story, and a great operatic story it is, but for one thing. There's no love interest. Gustav did have a queen, a wife, Sophia Magdalena, a Danish princess who bore him two sons, an heir and a spare. But there's quite a bit of evidence that it was a loveless marriage, and in fact, at least insofar as the circumstantial evidence is concerned, Gustav seems to have been homosexual. Information that at least the immediate family and privy members of the court were aware of. Well, that might make great fodder for an opera today, but would certainly have given pause to a composer or, or librettist in the 19th century. They would never have attempted to deal with that kind of information. As is sometimes the case with opera stories like this, another composer set the same story about 30 years before Verdi eventually got around to it in 1857. That composer was the Frenchman Daniel Aubert, whose librettist, the writer of the text or the play that the opera was based on was Eugène Scribe. Scribe realized that this story simply would not work on the operatic stage unless the main character, the king, had a love interest. And how fascinating would it be to make that love interest the wife of the assassin, Madame Amelia Ankerstrom. 
Ankerstrom was also elevated in Screed's libretto in position to the king's closest advisor, his best friend, lending a sense of disloyalty to the king's actions, which, of course, would enrage this courtier and make him want to kill the king. Poor Sophia Magdalena, the king's real long-suffering wife, doesn't even make an appearance, nor is she even alluded to. In both Aubert's opera and Verdi's opera, the audience assumes that the king is a bachelor. It's interesting that Scribe gets much about the court of Gustav absolutely right. There is a lot of good historical detail in this libretto that eventually made it into Verdi's Italian version. But the plot device that the story hangs on, the forbidden love between the king and the wife of his closest ally, it's complete fiction. But look, who cares? Scribe's edition of Amelia was a stroke of theatrical genius because it ups the ante, doesn't it? It creates an even greater reason for us to care about the characters Amelia, Gustav, and Ankerstrom, and puts the, um, the, the human emotions, the very real human emotions of the drama, in clearer relief. I've dealt with the love duet between the king and Amelia earlier in this series, but I haven't dealt with the music of Ankerstrom at all. And he's a really key character in all this political plotting, isn't he? Well, first of all, Verdi gives the role over to baritone, which is a great choice. In the third act, after he realizes that the king has fallen in love with his own wife, he sings a wonderful aria in which he unleashes his bitter disappointment in the man who is both his friend and his betrayer, the king, while at the same time he reflects on his lost love of Amelia in a way that only Verdi was able to carry off. The aria, Eritu, begins in anger, then turns on a dime and becomes a kind of hymn of regret and bitter disappointment. Here's the beginning of the aria. The accompaniment from the orchestra alone tells you how angry and how really crushed this man, Ankerstrom, is. Then about halfway through, Ankerstrom's attention turns to Amelia as he remembers how much they once loved each other, the tenderness, the kisses that will never happen again, all now dashed because of the king's selfishness. So the opera becomes more than just a story about a political struggle between two camps in the 18th century Swedish court. It becomes about real human beings dealing with love and loss, a much deeper experience in the theater than mere politics. This is great stuff. I'll see you at the opera. Oh, <laughs> my
Anuncia 